The 19th century is often perceived as an era marked by an unwavering faith in science and the capacity to comprehend the objective reality of the world. The remarkable material affluence of England, coupled with its global economic and military supremacy, fostered a prevailing sense of confidence and at times even arrogance among the nation and its populace. Given this wealth-driven success, there arose minimal cause to question the authenticity of the Christian faith. The visible outcomes of Christian devotion were evident to all. The conclusion of the strictly moral Victorian epoch, coinciding with the discomfiture stemming from the struggles encountered while subjecting a handful of African farmers to English dominion in the Boer War, prompted a re-evaluation of the once accepted English societal values. As a result, modernist writers embarked on a twofold enterprise. Not only did they venture into stylistic innovations within novel composition, but they also aspired to introduce a fresh critical perspective on social structures and moral principles. The writers of this era were confronted with a disintegration of confidence in long-standing certainties, beliefs about the divine, the Christian faith, individuality, knowledge, materialism, history, and the overarching meta-narratives. The emergence of psychoanalysis through the work of Sigmund Freud and the anti-capitalist theoretical discourses of Karl Marx during the latter half of the 19th century significantly contributed to this epoch of questioning established values. In terms of themes, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness profoundly challenged the rationale and necessity of Europe's imperialistic ventures in Africa. In earlier centuries, authors like Daniel Defoe had championed British imperialism in popular works such as Robinson Crusoe, highlighting the perceived benefits that the dissemination of the Christian message would bring to the indigenous inhabitants of colonized territories. However, Conrad, widely recognized as a pessimist, chose to pivot the focus onto the adverse repercussions of imperialism on the African people and their nations. While not aligned with Marxism, Conrad exhibits a strong critique of Western exploitation in Africa, particularly condemning the treatment of native Africans by European capitalists. Instead of overt moralizing, Conrad frequently adopts a journalistic approach to depict Africa, showcasing disturbing scenes of native Africans subjected to enslavement or reduced to subhuman existence. Africans are often portrayed as shadows or mere shapes, seldom as individuals. An instance stands out when we encounter a warship anchored off the coast. With no shelter in sight, it is bombarding the forest. Marlowe underscores that the skeletal forms of the Africans were clearly visible and how these natives would often disappear into the woods, seeking a place to meet their demise. These descriptions require no explicit moral commentary. The imagery itself speaks volumes, leaving the reader to question the ethical implications of European colonization. Amidst these portrayals, sporadic, moralistic remarks emerge, casting aspersions on the values prevalent in the Victorian era. Marlowe isn't a pedagogue or a philosopher. He is essentially a skilled storyteller, preferring to reveal the reality of situations, allowing readers to form their own judgments. While Conrad's prose seldom delivers direct moral lessons, a feature that contributes to the readability of his novels. There are instances where he seeks to convey moral insights more explicitly. Early in the narrative, Marlowe elucidates to his audience that the conquest of the earth, often entailing seizing land from those with different appearances or slightly flatter nose than ourselves, is a grim affair when scrutinized closely. This statement encapsulates a story's moral essence. 
Yet the true horror of this displacement of lands and lives can only be comprehended through Conrad's intricate portrayal of Africa and its people. Conrad thus shares affinities with other modernist writers in his critique of established values and convictions. The Victorian era is unveiled as riddled with contradictions and the subsequent shattering of humanity's positive image and the world's optimism during the onset of the First World War a decade later only underscores this fact. Where Conrad deviates from Wolf and Joyce lies in his emphasis not on the mundane but on extraordinary circumstances. His intention wasn't to delve into the mirrored thoughts passing through the minds of ordinary characters in everyday scenarios. Indeed, Conrad's characters, particularly exemplified by Mr. Kurtz, deviate from the norm. However, even amid his more conventional presentation of methods, Conrad wasn't entirely estranged from theories accentuating the significance of consciousness and the capriciousness of external reality. Heart of Darkness begins with a scene aboard a boat on the Thames River. A few sailors, idle for the evening, engage in a relaxation. It's at this juncture that Marlowe, a narrator appearing in several of Conrad's works, begins recounting a story to his fellow crew members. This story, narrated by Marlowe, essentially forms the plot of the novel. This approach of employing a narrator, though seemingly straightforward, effectively separates the author from the text. Nonetheless, the narrative doesn't solely hinge on this secondary narrator, assuming the author to be the primary narrator. Marlowe frequently recounts stories he has heard from other characters in the novel, allowing him to describe events he hadn't witnessed personally. For instance, both Marlowe and the reader learn about Kurtz's history through a Russian trader who collaborates with Marlowe. From a technical standpoint, when Kurtz informs the Russian trader, there is a good lot of cartridges left even yet. We delve into the fourth tire of narration. Kurt speaks to the Russian trader who then recounts an incident to Marlowe and Marlowe conveys the story to the listeners on the boat. One of these listeners is Conrad who imparts Marlowe's adventure to the reader. The result of employing such intricate narrative techniques is a subjective and occasionally unclear portrayal of events. Without an omnipresent narrator, certain gaps in the narrative are inevitable. As a human, the narrator cannot divulge everything, perhaps not even wanting to reveal everything, as exemplified Marlowe's reluctance to disclose trade secrets from his visit to the trading company in France. At other times, the narrator might be incapable of sharing all due to the limitations of sensory perception. Senses can be fallible, leading to misinterpretation. When Marlowe dozes on the steamer, he overhears the station manager and his uncle conversing outside, uttering disjointed sentences that baffle Marlowe's drowsy mind. Whether these fragments hold significance is left to the reader's imagination as Marlowe cannot offer an interpretation. Conrad's preoccupation with describing the African continent and its inhabitants might lead one to believe that he didn't align himself with a group of artists committed to uncovering inner truths. Paradoxically, it was the chilling veracity of the external world that granted Conrad's art its intended effect. In contrast to Wolf and Joyce, who emphasized consciousness, Conrad's writing style adhered more faithfully to the traditional conventions of depicting the external world. However, this isn't to imply that Conrad was indifferent to exploring the inner worlds of his characters. One interpretation of Heart of Darkness perceives the journey along the Congo River as an expedition inward, an attempt to unearth the truths deeply buried within the human heart and soul. The blurring of the external world within Heart of Darkness is most evident towards the story's conclusion with the introduction of Mr. Kurtz. Physically, Kurtz alternates between appearing as a towering seven-foot giant 
and a helpless infant lying on a stretcher. The physical attributes of gods thus become as enigmatic as the enigma he represents. Marlowe goes to the extent of characterizing Kurtz as merely a voice, suggesting that Kurtz's dominion over others stems not from his intrinsic power but from the compelling force of his speech. Throughout the novel, the reliability of the external reality is frequently called into question. During a challenging river passage where Marlowe searches for potential hazards, he remarks, when you have to attend to things of that sort, to the mere incidents of the surface, the reality, the reality I tell you, fades. Furthermore, the reality of the Russian harlequin residing deep in the Congo jungle is rightly met with skepticism. Conrad, despite relying on the visual impressions of Africa witnessed by Marlowe, appears cognizant of the dubious nature of this external world. However, even while acknowledging the necessity for subjectivity in interpreting the outside world, Conrad appears hesitant to go as far as later modernist novelists in completely rejecting objective reality. While modernists like Wolfe and Joyce were willing to discard descriptions of the external world in their prose, Conrad, in terms of style, only ventures as far as employing negative adjectives such as invisible, unintelligible, inaudible, and impossible in his descriptions of what he perceives as describable. The erosion of traditional beliefs and values in English society is arguably linked to a state of existential solitude. As the positive aspects of the nation's history and identity were being called into question, the reliance on conventional community building institutions such as religion and the Christian church was also waning. Certainty about the existence of God faded, the grasp on the external world became uncertain, and the time-honored values that the nation had upheld for centuries lost their credibility. An outcome of these profound shifts was the spiritual isolation and compelled individualism experienced by characters in modernist fiction. Characters like Wolfe's Mrs. Dalloway, Joyce's Leopold Bloom and Stephen Didelis, Lawrence's Paul Morel and Birkin, Conrad's Lord Jim, Mr. Kurtz, Axel Heist and Nostromo, exemplify this lonely introspective individualism. While individualistic characters have held prominence in English novels since the early 18th century and the publication of Robinson Crusoe, the prevalence of isolated, solitary figures in major modernist novels of the early 20th century seems far more coincidental. According to Walter Allen, much of Conrad's finest fiction revolves around tales of solitary individuals contending with external forces. Heart of Darkness introduces us to the ultimate loner, Mr. Kurtz and employs the narrator Marlowe, who similarly lives an unattached, individualistic life. Conrad describes Marlowe as a seaman, but he was a wanderer too, while most seamen lead, if one may so express it, a sedentary life. In a manner akin to Mr. Kurtz, Lord Chim is compelled into social exile. Nostromo prides himself on his non-committal stance in the Diamond War, and Axel Heist seeks solace in isolation on a deserted island in victory. Conrad's central characters are unmistakably aligned with the tradition of modernist fiction, emphasizing individuality and loneliness. This aspect of modernist literature undoubtedly reflects the bewildering societal transformations taking place in English society at the time. One of the most groundbreaking shifts in novel writing during the modernist era was a renewed emphasis on epistemology, how knowledge is acquired. Alongside the rejection of an absolute external reality, modernists discarded the concept of an all-knowing God, thereby negating the presence of an omniscient narrator in storytelling. Descriptions of the external world took on a subjective nature and knowledge was sought through sensory perception rather than reason or divine insight. 
this presented modernist authors with a dilemma. In the absence of an omniscient narrator, how were narrative events to be conveyed? The well-known approach that gained greater prominence after Conrad's passing in 1925 was a stream of consciousness method where events are depicted as the impressions of diverse characters. Wolf's The Waves epitomizes an attempt to completely remove the omniscient narrator, albeit at the potential cost of reduced readability. Joyce's Ulysses and a portrait of the artist as a young man blend narration with stream of consciousness passages. In contrast, Conrad opted to employ the subjective narrator to create distance between himself, the omniscient narrator, and the text. The use of these narrative techniques in the 20th century has been extensively scrutinized, perhaps excessively so in some regards. An essential question emerges. Does the utilization of a subjective narrator genuinely result in distancing the author from the text? Marlowe, after all, is a fictional character who can speak only through Conrad's words. Hence, every word in the text ultimately belongs to Conrad, a point underscored by critic Chinua Achebe in his essay An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Achebe argues that while Conrad seems to construct a buffer between himself and the moral universe of his story, this effort is in vain if the intention is to isolate the author from the narrator's moral and psychological turmoil. The lack of an alternative reference framework to evaluate characters' actions and viewpoints undermines Conrad's objectivity, rendering the complex narrative system ineffectual. In contrast to this cynical perspective, Walter Allen defends Conrad's use of the narrator as a clever artistic strategy. Allen likens Conrad's use of Marlowe to Emily Bronte's utilization of Nellie Dean in Wuthering Heights, asserting that Marlowe allows Conrad to dramatize the action and compel readers to perceive it through his eyes, offering an intense focus. While Allen's point holds merit, his assertion that Marlowe's device permits Conrad to make explicit comments otherwise unattainable appears somewhat naive. The use of the subjective narrator, while commendable for stylistic experimentation, falls short of distancing the author from the text. The moral values and insights within Heart of Darkness belongs to Joseph Conrad, not Captain Marlowe. The language belongs to Conrad, not Marlowe, and the claim that a narrator enables the novelist to maintain total objectivity is unfounded. Conrad's exceptional command of the English language has been widely praised, especially considering that he didn't begin learning English until his mid-twenties. His prose is undoubtedly elegant, sweeping readers along with its vivid descriptions, primarily aimed at deepening character portrayal. Occasionally, the desire to embellish the prose's style has a counterproductive effect, leading, as Walter Allen puts it, to Conrad becoming intoxicated by the exuberance of his own gorgeous verbosity. However, it's not the elegance of or grandeur of prose that holds significance in discussing modernist fiction. Rather, it's the experimental nature of Conrad's writing. For a discussion on modernist prose styles, James Joyce is a particularly relevant point of reference. In his pursuit of rendering the mind's impressions, Joyce dispensed with traditional syntax and vocabulary conventions in favor of a more experimental approach. As a result, his major work, Ulysses, features sentences with only one word, inventive vocabulary, when existing words fall short, and entire sections written devoid of punctuation marks. While Conrad's prose doesn't experiment with language to this degree, certain passages in his novel abandon grammatical rules, best illustrated by a description of the journey to the main station along the river in Heart of Darkness. Day after day, with a lamp and shuffle of sixty pair of bare feet behind me, each pair under a sixty-pound load, camp, cook, sleep, strike, camp, march, now and then a courier dead in harness, at rest in the long grass near the path, 
with an empty water gourd and his long staff lying by his side, a great silence around and above. Perhaps on some quiet night, the tremor of far-off drums, sinking, swelling, a tremor vast, faint, a sound weird, appealing, suggestive and wild, and perhaps with as profound a meaning as the sound of bells in a Christian country. While experimental syntax isn't a dominant aspect of Convert's prose, the existence of these lengthy, grammatically subjectless passages reveals his willingness to experiment with presentation techniques, although in a more conservative manner. Despite encountering indeterminate adjectives like invisible, impossible, unimaginable, rather frequently, Converts prose adheres to traditional structures Experimental passages are infrequent and his language aligns more with that of 19th century novels than the high modernist period. Viewing Joseph Convert's place in the history of English novels could be likened to a bridge connecting the more traditional 19th century novelists with the experimental early 20th century modernist writers. Of course, the distinctions between such categories are often blurry and subject to interpretation Yet, adhering to the conventional definitions of modernism as a literary movement, it appears that Conrad, while acknowledging the possibilities of experimenting with narrative style, language, character portrayal, and artistic focus, chose to maintain ties, to some degree, with a stylistically conservative Victorian era. While Conrad did indeed share Virginia Woolf's conviction that art could no longer be confined within traditional narrative structures, his inclination to venture into experimental prose is debatable. There are instances of linguistic exploration and delving into characters' consciousness in Heart of Darkness, though within certain limits. Modernist style passages are scarce, with the majority of narrative being expressed in conventionally, grammatically precise prose. This does not imply, however, that Conrad's works lack their deserved place in the canon of modernist literature. He did extensively experiment with various narrative techniques, employing subjective narratives to unfold story while simultaneously deviating from linear plot structures. The revolutionary impact of using a narrator might be subject to questioning, but the intricate development of plot structures undoubtedly marks a departure from 19th century novel writing methods. Ultimately, Conrad's rejection of established values and beliefs coupled with his focus on introspective, solitary characters, align his fiction with the works of other novelists from the modernist era.